of interviews with an NHL legend, a Hollywood star, and a gold medal track athlete. Plus, suitors for the Celtics are emerging, the NBA is trying to prevent future betting corruption, and a carriage dispute is making life hard for the Chicago sports fan. It's Monday, October 21st. I'm your host, Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we have NHL legend and ESPN analyst Mark Messier in the same interview with actor Danny DeVito. I'll just let you wonder about that one for a minute. Plus, we have three-time gold medal track-winning athlete Gabby Thomas. Later, I speak with our reporter Alex Schiffer about one of the more interesting historical what-ifs you'll hear. Plus, we have stories from the NBA, NFL, MLB, and college sports. Here are your top headlines. We begin with the conclusion of a story that's been unfolding for months. Hassan Reddick ended his holdout with the New York Jets on Sunday morning after new agent Drew Rosenhaus worked with the Jets owner Woody Johnson to get the deal done. As part of the arrangement, Reddick will make $9 million plus up to another $12 million in incentives to help him recover the $12 million in fees associated with this holdout. League rules prevent the Jets from simply waiving the fees. The two sides will begin working towards a long-term extension. According to Adam Schefter, Reddick is the first player in a decade to hold out past week one of the regular season and then receive an adjusted contract. On Friday, UVA basketball coach Tony Bennett shocked the NCAA world with a sudden retirement, just two weeks before the season was set to tip off. Bennett kept it simple with his explanation, saying, I'm no longer the best coach to lead the program in this current environment. He pointed to his issues with the current student-athlete landscape, quote, I think it's right for student-athletes to receive revenue. Please don't mistake me. The game in college athletics is not in a healthy spot, and there needs to be change, and it's not going to go back. In the media world, FanDuel has officially taken over for Bally's as the naming sponsor for the bankrupt Diamond Sports. As a part of the deal, FanDuel TV will air programming like Up and Adams on Diamond's 16 local networks. Diamond has been in Chapter 11 bankruptcy proceedings since March of 2023 and reported $8.67 billion of debt last year. Many MLB teams have pulled out of their broadcasting plans with the company, and until Friday morning, it was only the Atlanta Braves who remained. Now we can add the Miami Marlins to that list for a whopping grand total of two. Out of the true sports equinox coming on October 30th, in which all four major American sports will have games, we had a mini equinox on Sunday with notable events in F1, football, the WNBA, and MLB. The day began early with the Jaguars playing in London, even after their flight was delayed due to Hurricane Milton. The crowd was dominated by the Jags' teal, not unexpected for a team who has played in London 12 times in the past 10 seasons, including last week, and the Jags picked up a win. Meanwhile, the U.S. Grand Prix got underway in Austin, the second of three F1 races on, in the U.S. on the calendar. The race was part of the ESPN Texas takeover for the big weekend of sports in Austin, which also included Saturday's upset of number one Texas by number five Georgia. In the Big Apple, the New York Liberty closed out the WNBA Finals at home with a Game 5 victory against the Minnesota Lynx, winning their first championship in team history. This concludes the biggest WNBA season to date and officially sets their sights on the start of Unrivaled as the next major watchpoint in women's professional hoops. Across the country, the Dodgers defeated the Mets to secure their end of the MLB Dream World Series matchup. The Paul Classic will feature MLB's two biggest markets after the Yankees beat the Guardians in extra innings to advance. Game 1 is on Friday. A new series on Prime Video focuses on some of history's most dramatic Game 7s. I spoke to two executive producers on the series, Mark Messier, who is in two of the Game 7s featured in the series, and Danny DeVito, who has not yet played in a Game 7, but still had plenty to say about them. I very much enjoyed chatting with both of them, and that's coming up next. Uh, very excited to be joined now by NHL legend and ESPN analyst Mark Messier and Hollywood legend Danny DeVito. Welcome, Mark. Welcome, Danny. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for nice with you. you. Great to have you both on. So you two are executive producers on this Amazon Prime series Game 7, which goes across sports and features two Stanley Cup final Game 7s involving you, Mark. Uh, what kind of story did you want to tell in revisiting these big moments? It was, it's much more than just about the Game 7 itself. Uh, it's a journey to get there. Um, and I think the power in team, the power in uh, unwavering self-belief, um, Oftentimes in game seven, things don't go your way and uh, you got to be able to not only react to it, but adapt to it. Um, and I think the stories and the lessons learned from this docuseries is going to be so uh, important for our young boys and girls that are going to watch it that uh, that uh, when you get knocked down, you get back up. Uh, you got to believe in yourself. You have to have a vision of where you're trying to, and what you're trying to achieve. And collectively, it's a team is incredibly powerful when you work together. Um, 
And so for me, being able to tell those stories and my own journey through Game 7s and my own and the impact it's had on my life outside of sport, I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. And just real quick, Mark, have you lost a Game 7? I'm trying to think. Unfortunately, my record is I played in nine Game 7s. And unfortunately, uh, uh, well, my record in, in Game 7 or our record in Game 7s is 7-2. Seven and two. Uh, unfortunately, the, the two sting, the two losses. <laughs> yeah, you remember those better <laughs> than the seven. Yeah. Um, uh, and Danny, what appealed to you about this project? Yeah, the thing about, I come from a, a different, uh, kind of the similar but different angle. When Mark and, and Isaac uh, approached me about this uh, game seven idea. See, the idea is that I am like not a like a, a, a I don't I'm not a sports enthusiast all year long, but when it comes to the excitement of the game seven, I'm glued to the, the you know either the television or going to the to go into the game. If I can do that, I mean I just am like a uh, uh, I'm intensely into playoffs and World Series, and if they get to a game seven. I am on the edge of my seat. That's where my passion lies in the in the whole. I, and I also relate to it in another way, in a personal way like that. I feel like we all go through game sevens all the time in our lives. I mean, whether it's, you know, the 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 young man who's like going to ask her fian his fiance's father for her for the girl's hand in marriage. Well, that, you that's, know, a game that's a game seven moment, Danny. That's a game seven moment. You know, before you walk in that door and go, hum, 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 hum. you know what I mean? That That is, and now, it, you see, the the other thing is what Mark was saying is the, is the pick, me, pick me up of it. You know, you work hard, you do everything. Same thing in my business. You work hard, you go right down to the wire, you give it all. Right. You may sometimes you get a, 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 a little bit of a crack of the bat or sometimes the, the puck just whacks on the on the net, you know, or, or it just rims and goes away, you know, in, in basketball. But, you know, that if you if, even in the defeat, you know, that the next, you know, you've got another there's always going to be game sevens. Mm -hmm. So you just learn from that last one. What can you learn from the way you acted in or the way it was in that? Because because everybody gives their all, it's just like sometimes somebody's got to win, sometimes some somebody's got to lose. That's like the excitement of it. I love, and also the fans. I'm like yeah. in in our series, we we do uh, uh, the the docu hits all all the players the the whole excitement of the game, the coaches, the players, the people, but the fans, you know, send it through the roof. Yep. They are like, you know, rabbit. Yeah. yeah. And Mark, actually, I want to get your thoughts on that as someone who's been through nine game sevens. Do you find there are game seven equivalents in life or are, are those like truly singular moments? I think everybody in life, uh, whether you're a sport person or not, has game seven moments that they're faced with that's going to alter their life one way or another. Um, you know, Danny can tell you his own, uh, but there's there's uh, there's parallels in in sports. And, and the lessons learned in sports into life. Uh, and I think uh, when you talk about a game seven moment of life, uh, you're going to be faced with a decision that's going to, to uh, you know, sway your trajectory one way or another. And you have to be, there's tools uh, available for people and players to perform when the pressure is the most. Uh, why do some players, why are some players able to handle the pressure and others aren't what are the lessons learned when you didn't perform under pressure or what did you do about it uh, did you did you stay down or did you get yourself back up and and ask yourself this the hard questions about how i can do better next time i think that's life and i think that's what's so compelling about the game seven brand is that it's not just about sports it's about life and uh, everybody in life is going to be faced with those critical game seven decisions not only once i'm sure in their life but many times and we think that uh, through this docu-series, we can te teach some of those skill sets for our young boys and girls that we've been watching to arm themselves with the decisions that they're going to need in order to make the right decision when their Game 7 moment comes. Yeah. We're seeing a proliferation of these sports docu-series. I think there's a lot of fan interest. And this one I would put 
somewhat in the category along with like the last dance who you know showed michael jordan and there's a new one coming out about the red sox that's a huge moment of glory but also there's a nostalgia component and i'm wondering either of you can chime in on this what do you think are the the ingredients to a really well-told story about these huge moments in the past well from my uh, spot in storytelling i think that there's always a beginning a middle and end and uh you know uh in in our series, we have that. We have a beginning. We've this setup. If you if you don't, if even if you don't know the the the, the teams, if you're not a, I mean, uh, an avid sports fan, like we have, we have uh, Mike Morello talking about like the, the Cubs, and he's like he lives and eats and breathes and sleeps and knows every nuance of it all the way. But if you're a not, if you're a person who just digs sports and wants that experience of uh, of a really well told tale for an you know whatever they are an hour, you know you're you're gonna you go to Amazon on the twenty second of uh, October and you uh, you know you enjoy it. It's gonna be great. Now we we would we would hope that we would do next year again. We did five episodes this year. Next year we want to do seven. Yeah, I, for, and for, for me, it, for, for me, it's the uh, it's the emotional uh, point uh, of a storytelling. It's a human interest uh, that comes through in our in our in our stocky series, and everybody looks at the on ice or the on field or the on court uh, product of the players. But there's so much more that goes into uh, being a champion in any sport or being a champion in life. Of there, and I think, and the pressures that the players face, um, and that they have to deal with uh, the behind the scenes look on what they're thinking about at the time. Um, it just it just brings in so many. It's a human interest story to, uh, more so than a sports story, which I think is is. And to Danny's Danny's point, it's an incredibly beautiful beautiful blend of the two, which is where sports lies, and which where where sports uh, brings in so much passion into the into this into the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mark Messier, Danny DeVito, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank, thank you very you. much. Great. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com fieldofgreens.com. Fans of the Chicago White Sox, Blackhawks, and Bulls haven't had a ton to cheer for recently. The White Sox just finished a historically bad season. The Blackhawks have had four straight losing seasons, and the Bulls have made the playoffs twice in their last nine tries, losing in the first round both times. Now their fans are facing a new challenge, watching the games at all. Local broadcaster CHSN is in a dispute with Comcast, with the Blackhawks season underway and the Bulls about to start. It's the same basic story from recent carriage disputes. Comcast wants to put CHSN on its most expensive tier, while CHSN wants the greater distribution of the middle tier. CHSN's president, Jason Coyle, said on Saturday that the channel is, quote, voluntarily taking a significant haircut with its latest offer, and Comcast has not countered with any offers of its own. Meanwhile, CHSN has a streaming app ready to go, but they're holding off on releasing it during the negotiations. We're going to be figuring out the best way for MLB, NHL, and NBA teams to distribute their local games over the next few years, and then we'll figure out how much money they can make off of that. Until then, we're going to have a lot of messes like this one that no one really benefits from. Suitors for the Boston Celtics are beginning to emerge, including one with a notable last name. Mark Bezos, half-brother of Jeff, is reportedly interested in the team. He's a founding partner of private equity firm High Points Capital and owns a stake in Amazon. He invested $10,000 in the company back in 1998, which I will too if I ever find a time machine. It's not clear how serious a bidder he is. 
Jeff Bezos always gets mentioned when a high profile team is for sale, but he has yet to bid on a team. The guess here is that he eventually buys the Seattle Seahawks or helps bring an NBA team to that city. Meanwhile, Robert Hale also appears very interested in the Celtics, and he has the advantage of already owning a stake. Another point in his favor is a net worth near $6 billion stemming from Granite Telecommunications, which he founded in 2002. The team isn't in a particular rush to complete the sale, so this one is going to play out over months with more names floated, and eventually we'll find out who has the cash and the desire to spend more than anyone ever has before on an NBA team. Over to an NBA team whose owner is known for sparing no expense, the Los Angeles Clippers will be without star wing Kawhi Leonard for an indefinite period as he recovers from inflammation in his knee. This puts a wrench in an anticipated season for the Clippers who are set to play their first game at the brand new Intuit Dome on Wednesday. But it gets even dicier when you realize that the Clippers don't own their draft pick in the upcoming year. Instead, it resides with the Oklahoma City Thunder, who are projected a top three team in the Western Conference. And of course, it gets even worse when you realize that the Clippers gave up the pick for Paul George, who they let walk for nothing this summer. Steve Ballmer's tenure as the Clippers owner has been defined by his big swings for a championship, which really began in, with the team's 2019 offseason, where they brought in Leonard and George, trading Shy Gilgis Alexander and five first round picks for the latter. Ironically, last year, the Thunder finished six games ahead of the Clippers as the top team in the West. Now that gap is expected to grow even larger, and the Clips will have nothing to show for it. It's an interesting pendulum to watch as the eager new NBA ownership comes into the mix. Sacrificing long-term stability for quick returns may inflate ticket and merchandising sales temporarily, but can end with a dire-looking future for the team. Meanwhile, the NBA has reached a deal with sportsbooks not to offer prop bets on players on 10-day or two-way contracts. That might sound like random minutia, but it closes a weak spot that caused the league's biggest scandal in years. Honestly, the NBA is pretty lucky that the John Tay Porter story didn't blow up into something much bigger. The former Toronto Raptors forward was found to have conspired with gamblers who placed an $80,000 parlay that paid out $1.1 million if Porter underperformed in an individual game. Porter was banned from the league, and he's an example of the corruption detection systems that are in place working effectively, but it's also easy enough to understand his incentives. He was making $56,000 on a two-way contract. We don't know what his cut of the betting scheme was, but it's likely he stood to at least double his salary. Compare that to a player making the NBA minimum, which is $1.16 million for a rookie, $1.86 million for a second-year player, and it goes up from there. Not that players making that money are incorruptible, but the risks are much higher. The bigger question is college athletes, who, even with NIL and eventual revenue sharing, generally make John Tay Porter-type figures or less, and many of whom don't expect to go pro. Unless there's a blanket ban on prop bets on college athletes, the possibility of similar corruption at the college level is going to linger. Track and field sees the possibility to grow beyond a sport people only care about once every four years during the Olympics. I spoke to medal-winning track athlete Gabby Thomas on growing the sport and her experience at one of the new track leagues, Athlos. That conversation is coming up next. I'm joined by three-time gold medal-winning track athlete Gabby Thomas. Welcome, Gabby. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Hey, great to have you on. So we're in the part of the, the four-year cycle where track just got a lot of attention. Now many people are moving on to other things, but I also imagine you made some new fans in Paris. How much attention do you feel right now on the track world? Uh, I do feel like there's a lot of attention in the track world right now, and it's a really exciting time. Um, coming off of these Paris 2024 Olympics, I think we had a lot of eyes on us. And then in addition to that, we have the Netflix docuseries that premiered right before the Olympics, and then season two is coming along right afterwards. Um, and then we have a couple of uh, track initiatives that are that are on the way for next year too. And it sounds like, you know, the there are efforts. You know, the, the the wheels are turning right now to grow the attention. Where who do you think is like really the driving forces in you know making track more of a a sport that people are are tracking? Um, you know, day to day, month to month. Well, I think that the personalities in track um, are are really great. Um, they always happen, to be honest, but with our ability to use social media to kind of showcase our personalities and storytell, um, I think it's driven a lot of attention to track and field. I mean, we sparked the interest from the box to box film producers to to make a show about us. Um, we sparked the interest of, of these people who want to invest in our sport and start these new track leagues because we have such an interesting product. So I really do think it's the personalities of the athletes that are kind of spearheading um this new phase, this new era of track and field. And what was it like to, you know, be followed around by, by Netflix? <laughs> I mean, were they, were they talking to you or is it just, there's always a camera in the background? 
Yeah, I mean, they are probably like my favorite media people that I've ever worked with. The They did follow us around quite a bit with the cameras, but they were so fun. Um, they're really good at their jobs and they have a really great way of getting us to kind of open up and feel comfortable around them, um, which is great because they were with us so frequently for so many hours in a day. <laughs> We also have this new track league backed by Alexis Ohanian Athlotes, uh, which you have participated in. Uh, what was your experience like with that? That was great. Um, Alexis had reached out to me in the very early stages of that. He had just had this kind of budding idea of, of what of being involved in track and field, um, specifically the women of track and field. And you know, he came into that not knowing anything about track. He didn't know where we ran or what the league looked like or anything about track and field kind of outside of the Olympics. And so he came in with a really open mind and a listening ear and wanted to hear from my perspective what was great with track and field currently and then what could what could go better. Uh, so it, it was really fun working with him on that and just his commitment to, to doing something for the athletes and making the event for the athletes. And yet, given that athlete-driven nature of it, how did you see – Athlos evolve from that phone call to yeah. the race, the races? I mean, it, it was incredible. I think the the event itself was a perfect track meet, right? You had great competition. Um, it was at Icon Stadium, which is somewhere that we compete very often. And I, I think what really set it apart was what an amazing job the, the event was just as a production. I mean, it was such a fun and entertaining event. And that's kind of, that's what sports is for. It's for entertainment. And I, I think sometimes in track and field, we lose sight of that. Um, we have people running the sport who just do it the same way every time. And you, you throw these meets and it's only for, you know, like the niche track fans who really just know who the athletes are and have spent so many hours of their time researching us. But no, Athlos really gave us the ability to tell our stories, to show the spectators in the audience who, who are streaming at home, who we are. Um, there was a music performance by Megan The Stallion. And I think what stood out most to me about Athlos was it felt like it was for us. I mean, normally when we go run at meets, we're, the dynamic is that we should be grateful to be there. And it, it's kind of just like, go run. Um, you're always being told, no, no this, no that. And that one, we really felt like they wanted us there and we were valued um, as the main product. Yeah. And I'm wondering you know, what other innovations you're seeing in track, either from Athlos or you know other, other leagues or competitions. Yeah, I mean, Athlos was... Clearly great. Um, one event, but much more to come down the line. Grand Slam Track League is another league that is in the works right now, which I think is really exciting and good for the sport. Anytime you can have um, a league or, or a situation where athletes are committed to competing, I think that will definitely grow the sport forward. Um, I know there's another one in the lead um, in the in the works right now called Duel. Um, I saw something about Noah and Tyreek Hill racing on there. So I think that's something that will also drive attention to the sport, uh, which is really, really cool. And then, of course, we have this docuseries season two coming out in November. So, so many great things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, Duel is, a, you can make it like this, this ego contest. <laughs> um, do you feel like, you know, and I think that's, you know, whether or not it's a show or, you know, real egos are at stake here that drives interest a lot of yes, the time. Um, exactly. Do you feel like that's already embedded into track? It just needs to be shown? I think there are definitely rivalries that are embedded in track. Um, I think it's such an easy, it's such a low hanging fruit, right? Like we can, we can do that. We just need to tell those stories and, and get it out there. Um, because across, I mean, especially the sprints and across the different countries, those stories already exist and they're here. Um, the Netflix docuseries did a great job of showcasing that. Um, but also encouraging athletes to run. We need incentives to actually go out on the track and compete um, and put those rivalries to the test. And so these are all opportunities where athletes feel empowered and excited to go run and compete. I think one of the biggest problems in our sport is you never know when an athlete's going to compete and an athlete doesn't have to compete. The biggest stars in our sport don't have to go fly across the world to go compete for a small amount of money. So why would they? And so you're not getting to see these rivalries as a fan of the sport. Um, so I think we're going to be moving away from that in the next couple of years. And I think it'll be great for both athletes and, and fans. And I know, you know, Alexis Ohanian is a big backer of women's sports. Uh, but I'm wondering about just generally um, the if there's any kind of gender divide in the track world. Because the breakthrough stars, I think I don't. For me, I don't sense like it's weighted one way or the other, but that's just, you know, very much outsider's perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think one of the things I've always loved about track and field, truthfully, is that it kind of, 
there is so much gender parity in it. Um, it's one of those sports where we don't see, um, you know, this uneven inequity in pay or opportunity. Um, but I think right now it's such a big moment for women's sports in general. And I'm so happy that track and field is kind of being a part of that and, and getting pushed into that movement. I mean, we've seen it with the National Women's Soccer League, obviously the WNBA, um, and for track to be included in that conversation is, is just so exciting. I, the women just have an amazing product in track. We have such good rivalries. And Alexis told me when he, he came up with this idea because he saw us on social media. He saw what we were doing and how captivating it was and how interesting we were in our stories. So I think, you know, this is our time. You're part of an initiative with Eli Lilly focused on reducing the health equity gap in the U.S. What inspired you to be part of that? Yeah, I mean, partnering with Eli Lilly is uh, just such a dream for me because I love partnering with brands that are aligned um, in my values. And Eli Lilly is definitely co uh, committed to closing the gaps in health equity. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about with Eli Lilly is the Milestones into Meeting program that they have launched. Um, they are donating $5,000 for every medal or record uh, that is broken by Olympians and Paralympians uh, from the 2024 Olympics. And so my own accomplishments have um, gotten $15,000 <laughs> donated to closing the, the gap in health equity. So that's such a great and humbling feeling. Um, and just being a part of a brand and a company that's committed to that mission. If you had, you know, um, you know, if you got one wish for, for the track world in terms of, you know, growing it or just what you'd like to see in it, what, what would that be? Hmm. I mean, I, it's so simple. I, I think really just a league of our own where we can consistently race, where we can consistently get paid, um, where the setup is not where one race is it and the end all be all of your season like we have set up now. Um, I want us to exist like a professional sport and not like an amateur sport like we are now. Um, so uh, I'm seeing that on the horizon and I'm really excited about it. And my fingers are crossed that it will all <laughs> work out um, in this first go around next year, but maybe it'll be a few more years in the works. And I'm, I'm just happy to be a part of that. Yeah, that's, that's great. And Gabby Thomas, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. One of the most storied families in American politics nearly became owners of the current most valuable team in MLB. My colleague Alex Schiffer dug into one of the sports history's big what ifs that involves the Dodgers, the Kennedys, and even a brief mention of FDR. All that explains next. I'm joined now by front office sports breaking news and enterprise reporter Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for having me, Owen. So you wrote this really interesting feature for us about sort of a sports what if, also an American history what if, involving the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Kennedy family and the possibility that the two of them could have come together. Um, how might that have happened? Yeah, long story short, um, in 1950, Joseph Kennedy was exploring a potential sale or, or a potential bid to buy what would have been 50 percent of the Dodgers. Um, he would have bought Branch Rickey, who was obviously famous for uh signing Jackie Robinson and John Smith, the Pfizer chairman who had passed away, he would have bought their shares to get 50% ownership. And the idea was that one of his sons, most likely John F. Kennedy, the future president would have run the team had the purchase happened. That was what Joseph Kennedy's wishes were. And, uh, you know, this is kind of a thing survived through books, this little what if, and, uh, I tried to see just how realistic it was and what was fact, what was fiction, and, you know, how close were the Kennedys actually becoming a baseball family instead of a political one? How did you find this story in the first place? Yeah, if you want me to go through the full story development as to how this kind of came to be, I read The Boys of Summer, which is a really famous sports book by Roger Kahn about the Brooklyn Dodgers. I read that, I want to call it, you know, the springtime. Um, and at the very end of the book, there's this little blurb about Walter O'Malley meeting with Roger Kahn and talking about how uh, Joseph Kennedy, the Kennedy's father, was interested in buying the team at one point, allegedly to help his son run it, allegedly for his son, John, who obviously became our, I think, 35th or 36th president to run it. Um, I was in a Houston used bookstore um, a month later, and I saw a biography of Walter O'Malley that had more about that whole thing than the boys of summer. And so uh, I got rolling with those two bits of, of information, those little, you know, whatever was combined, like four or five pages out of like two books. And uh, then I started to get the ball rolling on what to kind of make of this, what was real, what wasn't. 
And uh, and here we are with the Los Angeles Dodgers now going into game six. Uh, I guess we'll have learned their fate by the time most people are listening to this, whether there's a game seven or not. I, I'm curious, like, how how substantial this was. Obviously, we had, So we had longtime Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley. We had Brand Tricky also owned a, a stake in the team. And they were getting interest from Joseph P. Kennedy, father of John, Ted, and Robert. The anecdote in the book essentially shows that uh, after John L. Smith, who was one of the, the Pfizer uh, board chair in 1950, passed away, who also owned 25% of the team, as did Branch Rickey and Walter O'Malley. Uh, Branch Rickey was flying home with Walter O'Malley from John Smith's funeral. And before going to the funeral, Branch Rickey, who was trying to release his own shares of ownership and move on, uh, had gotten breakfast with Joseph Kennedy about essentially buying the Branch Rickey shares and the... Um, John Smith shares, and it would be 50-50 ownership, Walter O'Malley and Joseph P. Kennedy. And uh, Branch Rickey allegedly told um, Walter O'Malley, a lot of names going on here, uh, that um, that Walt, that he was no longer interested. Um, and we don't, there's a lot of things we don't know about this in terms of, um, you know, how long had they been talking about this? How far, you know, how close was Joseph Kennedy pulling the trigger before changing his mind? Um, there's only the, the tale of this has really survived through Walter O'Malley's writings. John F. Kennedy's presidential library has nothing on, um, Joseph Kennedy's papers indicating anything about the Dodgers or a sale or, or Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey's papers are at the library of Congress. I did not have the opportunity to go through them. A librarian did a very quick search for me and didn't find anything, but that doesn't mean that it's not still out there. Um, for all you, uh, Nicholas Cage, national treasure wannabes. Uh, looking for an assignment at the Library of Congress. So um, we, we I think what's definitive is that Joseph Kennedy was interested in buying the Dodgers and maybe one of his sons would have run it had that happened and they fell out of politics. But how much else, how much other legs there were to it aside from what, and I'm not accusing Walter O'Malley of being a liar, but I also think that, you know, the Kennedys are a family of politicians. You know, politicians don't always say everything they mean and, and whatnot. Um, you know, when this was all going on, John F. Kennedy was in the House of Representatives. He was firmly entrenched there as a, as a member of Congress. And he was planning in 1952 to run for either governor of Massachusetts or senator, which ultimately the latter of which he ran for and was elected to. So I think that Joseph Kennedy was definitely interested in buying the Dodgers. I don't think he would have pulled his sons out of politics to do so unless they had lost, which is why I think that the hypothetical of them doing it as like a landing pad, per se, if if things didn't work out or something health wise came up was also discussed. I think that's where the, the, this has the most teeth. Right. So this wasn't like we're replacing your politics career, but JFK was mentioned as, you know, the, the son who would potentially run the Dodgers as president. Um, because yeah, there's an anecdote, there's a detail in your story about how he had a bad back and they thought, you know, maybe the, the life of the politician will be too much for him physically. Um, obviously he was, um, as successful as one can be in that realm. But um, so that turned out not to be true. Um, just to, to kind of tie this all together, do you think there's any chance that if Joseph P. Kennedy um, took, you know, half a, took a 50% stake in the Dodgers while they were still in Brooklyn, do you think they might stay in Brooklyn? It's an interesting hypothetical. You know, uh, I recently finished reading The Power Broker by Robert Kerr, which is about Robert Moses, who you know, turn New York City into what it is today. He built the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. He built the Cross Bronx Expressway, Verrazano Bridge. Um, you know, in the book and also in the Walter O'Malley book I read goes into how, you know, Walter O'Malley did everything he could to keep the team in Brooklyn. You know, Robert Moses wasn't really interested in awarding him real estate um, in the areas in which he proposed a new ballpark as a replacement for Ebbets Field. Um, very interesting historical caveat that ties into the presidents and all this. The uh, main area of land that I think was by Gowanus and Borum Hill that Walter O'Malley wanted to build the Dodgers new ballpark in Brooklyn in was actually awarded to a guy named Fred Trump, who was also the father of a fellow president. Um, so, uh, so I don't, I, I think the interesting hypothetical is did Joseph Kennedy have the political connections and capital to sway what Robert Moses and keep the team in Brooklyn. I'm doubtful of that because Robert Moses really whistled to his own tune and nobody could really keep him in line. And, you know, if he had the ability to do something his way, he was going to do it. Um, so I would lean no, but it is an interesting hypothetical of 
Joseph Kennedy. And another interesting part of this is Joseph Kennedy uh, was part of FDR's cabinet. FDR was the only governor who really tried to impose his will on Robert Moses. So I don't think that would have done Walter O'Malley any favors of trying to keep the team in Brooklyn. Um, but you never know, right? And that's a lot of this is based on the what could have been. So I, I'm very doubtful given Joseph Kennedy's FDR ties and the way FDR was uh, was the one guy to stand up to Robert Moses. But uh, may, maybe maybe they there he Joseph Kennedy was the one guy to make peace with Robert Moses in this whole thing and keep the team there. But uh, let me skeptical. Yeah, I mean it's it's a fascinating what if, um, and you know one that could have had me walking to Brooklyn Dodgers games as a kid. Obviously, that did not end up happening. Um, thanks for the latest on the Kennedys and the Roosevelts, Sal Schiffer. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you for letting me be the historical correspondent for the day. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. NFL kickers might be the victims of their own success. There is growing chatter of the NFL eventually narrowing the uprights to make field goals more challenging. The reason is that kickers are more frequently successful at further and further distances. Through the first six weeks, kickers made 75% of kicks over 50 yards, which is the highest figure in league history. It's not just the rate of success, it's the quantity. Through week six, kickers had made 77 kicks of 50 or more yards, which is 14 more than the same point last year. Don't expect any action on this too soon, but NFL EVP Jeff Miller said, quote, There's no pending rule change on the matter, but the competition committee for sure is going to take a look at it and will follow the data as the season goes on and continue to track it. Meanwhile, Dolphins quarterback Tua Tagovailoa may be taking the field soon. The quarterback faced questions about his future after his most recent concussion, but he is set to practice on Wednesday with the hopes of playing on Sunday against the Cardinals. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend and consider sharing an episode with them. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.